We're dealing with the church of Thyatira. The fourth church of our seven churches. We start with verse 218, last class. Now Thyatira was not a political center. It was a commercial center. And it was very famous for a lot of different things. It was the smallest of the cities so far that we have covered. As a matter of fact, some of the famous commercial products of Thyatira had to do with dyeing in purple, the weaving, the cobblers. Um, they, they had associations that were very large. They had what was called the Association of Weavers, the Association of Cobblers. They had the Association of Special <laughs> Clothing Products. And they were very uh, commercial in their orientation in this city of Thyatira. Now, the thing this morning, as we think of this particular city, we dealt with the 18th verse in our first class that I did in Revelation on this semester. Now, starting today with verse 19, we closed by reading verse 19 in our last class. So this city was small and it was less significant. But this particular church preserved the faith which was imperiled at Pergamon. It shared with Smyrna the amazing ability of God's patience and it had the love that Ephesus did not have. As you study the commendations of this ministry, you really meditate and ponder over certain things about churches today, including ours. I know thy works, verse 19, I know thy works. Now, what he's saying here is, I know, and he uses the Greek word oida, and that's a perfect active participle, or rather it's an indicative mood, it's a perfect active indicative. And God is saying that I know completely to the extent that I have considered in the past, and I have permanent understanding about you. I know. God knows. And the active voice is the omniscience of God produces the action of knowing every single thing about Thyatira. And the indicative mood is I am dogmatic. I am dogmatic about what I know. And God is saying this with this perfect active indicative. He's saying that my knowledge of you isn't something my best friend told me. My knowledge of you isn't something that I saw once about you. Now that's the knowledge that most of us have about everything. Three or four people tell us something, we observe something, and our observations usually correlate with what we've heard because of our frame of reference, and that's what we know. And that's not knowing a single thing. Don't be stupid and form evaluations through subjective speculations of people. He says, I know. And I fill up the entire earth with my eyes. I perceive 
every single thing. I, I know everything. For example, here's a marriage, and you may tell about your marriage, and God uh, listens into your conversation, as he does, and he listens into what you're saying about your marriage. And God is saying, that's not what I know. They're speaking from emotions. They're speaking from personal limited experience. But I know the motives of both couples in that marriage. I know their heart and I know their thoughts are far off. I know. I knew way back in the past. Perfect tense. And the perfect tense brings me up to permanent results because I knew in the past what they were going to be like. And I have a permanent knowledge about that marriage, about that church, and about that individual. And therefore, I'm going to produce some action. And so we have the active voice. And the indicative mood is, God is not passive about what he knows. So if you're a freshman or you're new and you don't understand any relevancy of Greek, I'm explaining to you very carefully what each one of these constructs in the Greek mean. Now, the principle here is this. God gave praise to Ephesus and, and Thyatira where blame follows then to Smyrna and Philadelphia where there is no fault. But he said, I know thy works. Now, thy works, any activity undertaken for Christ's sake. What God is saying here, I know every single thing you undertake. That's pretty good for a ministry like this. God knows about our ministry to the illiterate, precious people. God knows our ministry to the, to the deaf, the able ministry, to the children, to the women. He knows our ministry to the uh, teenagers and the, those that aren't in the teenage bracket. And he knows our soul winning projects. He knows our specialized ministries that we're not talking about right now, which are kept in low profile. CIA's helping us out on that. <laughs> and uh, God knows all of this. It's a beautiful thing he does. I, you never really get too many wonderful articles written front page on religion. Greater Grace has 67 outreaches. Well, I don't think we'll see that in this lifetime. I hope we don't. Because you know you're compromising if they write that. But the Lord knows, and that's what counts. What did he know? He knew of their works and he knew of their charity. They had charity. The problem with their charity, it was, it was love of the Holy Spirit. But this church did not have categorical doctrine. They had doctrine, but they didn't have categorical doctrine. If somebody sat down with you and proved that there were seven or eight areas that you don't line up with categorical doctrine, would that upset you? Well, you could almost do that with every person around. Categories are to be obeyed through the Spirit. I know thy works, and I know your charity. You do have love. I know that, says the Lord. And the accusative case is used. And here it means love that has great extension. And then I know your service. 
that is your ministry how you minister to the needs of others you administrate properly and you minister accordingly that's what this is all about I know your service good administrators and very effective ministry something else I know about you that I like says the Lord and it's your faith I love your faithfulness what were they faithful to they were faithful in charity they were faithful in their service and they were faithful in their administration in church affairs and they had faith toward helping others he said I know this I appreciate it and I know your patience you actually have patience in respect to things and you have patience in relationship to circumstances you're able to abide under cupo and meno to abide you stay in a situation and you don't quit you stay in a circumstance and don't withdraw I know that about you and I appreciate it and he says I and thy works then he goes on to say the works here is mentioned twice in this verse and there's a reason for that the first works was a, any activity undertaken for Christ the second word for works relates to a fulfillment of a growing vision they kept growing in their vision they were not stagnated then he says and the last to be more than the first the church was not regressing but was increasing in all these areas for the Lord they were growing in production for the Lord now if we uh, stopped right there there would be good reason to thank God for the church of Thyatira because they had many marvelous qualities but it is quite a thing when you see a very beautiful healthy body and you find out it has a terminal disease you see a magnificent field but you're told it has poisonous weeds this ministry was a very healthy looking ministry and most ministries come to a place of stagnation passivity and by the way when you go out and pastor one of the most dangerous things that pastors do is stagnate and I think their stagnation often is a result of their self-image you put their self-image with their circumstances and any pressure and it equals stagnation and they are very passive to stay put with, with what they've got well, that's not the way to do it and by the way with God behind us that's the key to a ministry most of us are too spiritual to think of the word marketing in its proper prospect because we are so deeply spiritual we don't want to talk about practical ways of being successful the word success scares us well the truth is that we need pioneering ministers the day is gone when you're going to have pioneering ministers you don't want to pioneer that's too hard you want to go in and take a church over now isn't that right I mean we've got 50 fields to pioneer I can't get a pastor to pioneer Las Vegas wants us Dallas Texas wants us just to name two quickly I could name four others immediately but you're not going to have anybody pioneer today you might go there and rot 
and blame the area. Because it takes prayer. When I pioneered, and I pioneered three times. When I pioneered, it was prayer 5.30 in the morning. And I didn't care if anybody came or not. I had to get right with God anyway every day. Be prepared for the day. In the first six months, they didn't come. It was prayer. No discouragement whatsoever. A system of how to do it and then not to let a single thing stop you from doing it. I figured if I was working 12 and 14 hours a day in the summer at least with Cushman Bakery, why couldn't I work 14 hours for God full time? Very simple conclusion, wouldn't you say? And regardless what would happen, I would sow the seed, pray, and act just like I was going to build a big church. And the result was it grew from six to a thousand. But I didn't say, I, I think I'll quit the first six months when nothing happened. And act just like some stupid inv imbecile. And I didn't let circumstances get me down. I liked it much better than anything I had ever done. And if it only ended up with 30 people, I would have fun with the 30 people. You know why pioneers, pioneering ministries has gone today? Because there's a laziness that's established in the church of Jesus Christ. A lack of vision, a lack of faith, a lack of discipline, and a lack of knowing God. Well, I'm going to quit the ministry. There's too many trials. And why don't you go back and get a job as a clown somewhere? <laughs> well, the ministry is so tough. I need this. I need that. You need to get right with God and recommit yourself and define your values. God says, I know that you are producing. We had the international convention this year. And I had three guys one day at my table, and I just tuned into them. And boy, it was interesting. It was interesting until I got up for the rap session because I exposed it. The words went like this I've wanted to quit for the last six months. The other guy said, Really? That's strange. So have I. And another pastor heard it two seats down, and he confesses, I'm, I just wanted to quit for a year. Oh my God, three quitters at the table. <laughs> oh, they can't take the heat. They don't like it when the furnace is turned up. Because they don't know the God inside the furnace. I've had more people go A-W-O-L. And the reason they go A-W-O-L is they don't know God. What if Jesus Christ had gone A-W-O-L at the cross? And when they said, come down from that cross, he said, good idea. <laughs> Not a bad idea. Right? Right? Sure, and you and I would go to hell and burn forever. But Jesus didn't say that. He would not come down off the cross. You can talk the average person today into come down off the cross just by a good, serious, rationalistic dialogue. Now I'm going to quit school because and then the children and parents are too. Well then quit. Get your... <clears throat> Just don't have me counsel you because I'm already mad. <laughs> leave the school if you're supposed to leave it, but I don't want to hear the word quit because of precious. The greater the precious are, the more I want to stay in that arena and hit one more time. You don't quit. Well, 
My finances are bad in college. I don't see how I'm going to make it. And back home, the rent was cheaper. And I can go home and stay with mommy. And mommy will support me. And I'll get a job and learn a skill. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of the fact that you weren't learning a skill right here. I would call this pretty much the greatest skill you'll ever learn in your entire life. It's called... It's called Bible doctrine, how to think with God. Well, I'll go home and, and hear my local pastor on Wednesday, and you need a concentrated uh, time of learning the Bible and to be a skillful servant of righteousness. That's what you need. And I don't ever want to hear you even whisper quit. If anybody whispers it around you, you get some G-U-T-Z, put your chin up and say, get out of here. I don't have time to be around a person like you. Really shame them. Bunch of quitters. Gutless. No character. Well, I want to learn another kind of music. The gospel music, you know, isn't really where it's at. May I say this? God knows your motives. And people may not. They may not dare to tell you what they do know. But God knows. And God has known a long time. And because of what God knows, he's going to produce some kind of action. And what God knows, he knows dogmatically. And he said for Thyatira, they were getting better in their outreaches. How do you like that? Their outreaches were growing. Well, here's a ministry that had charity, service, outreaches, faith, and they were growing in their divine production. But there's one thing they lacked. And before we get into <coughs> a continuation of their problems, I want to show you what they lacked. They lacked an understanding of holiness. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. They lacked holiness. So we as individuals and we as a local assembly and anywhere that they receive this audio video tape must consider the doctrine of holiness. You may go on outreach, you may have charity, you may have faith. You may increase in your creativity of production without holiness. We need to understand what holiness is all about. Well, wherefore, verse 13, gird up your loins. In other words, the mind doesn't have loins, so the ancient custom was gird up means prepare your mind. Prepare your mind here is an aris middle participle. Now, this is not a direct middle. Remember, a direct middle, the subject receives the action of the verb. But this is a middle voice in which the subject participates in the action of the verb. This means, uh, and it's a participle, it's talking about a specific principle which is divine. And so we have here the principle that God wanted them to prepare their mind in a special work of preparation. The word mind here is a genitive singular, dia noia, and uh, it means, dia means through. And so what it really means is no eo, thought. So it means, think your thoughts through. 
Say that back with me. Think your thoughts through. Dia through no eo, n o e o for you that are writing it down. Thoughts. Think your thoughts through so that divine thoughts can influence you positively. So that divine thoughts can influence us positively. So, we have this great principle. God wants us to enter into spiritual dynamics by thinking through preparation of the mind. That's why many of you have come to Bible college. Preparation of your mind. Obviously, the minds of Americans is really something. If you look up the yellow pages and see all the psychiatrists and psychologists and you understand all the social centers, the counseling centers, the organizations for alcoholics and drug addicts and uh, whatever, uh, organization for sexual perversions and all these people come and they have what they call, as you know, group therapy. I was on the phone last night with somebody up in New England who I counsel on the phone, 55 minutes, and the subject was group therapy because they had been, had a problem with liquor and they were in detox and then they took him in what they call group therapy where everybody tells how the wicked father they had, what a terrible mother they had, and how they treated their dog last week. They wanted to kill the dog. And so they come back the next session and another two hours or three hours of negativity goes on. And I hate the way I feel today. And, and then the other one shouts the other one, and you look ugly too. And th This is supposed to produce character. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, yes. This is, this is uh, supposed to produce character. Oh, yes. Yeah, character. I wouldn't put a sick mental cat in there. <laughs> you, say, you say, you're not up on modern therapy. No, I'm up on spiritual therapy. Spiritual therapy. That's not how you prepare your mind. You prepare your mind by setting your mind on things above. Colossians 3.2 Your conversation is from heaven. Philippians 3.20 Your heart is fixed on God. Psalm 57.7 I don't want to fix my heart on what my... I broke the news. Who was it? To somebody yesterday. And it was sad to tell them. And they almost wept. I let them know that I did a research on their family line and their great-great-grandfather was a nut. <laughs> and consequently, it had been passed down somewhat to them. It ruined their day out there for coffee yesterday. I don't like to do things like that. It was just a research thing I had to do for a paper. And uh, now that kid has got to go through life knowing about his great... That didn't help him. One, he was happy until I told him. You see, <laughs> our conversation should be from what? From heaven. Heaven. That doesn't mean we're unrealistic or impractical. We certainly live in accountability and practicality, but it means that we're motivated, energized by thinking with God. And that's what gird up the loins of your mind means. Why am I bringing this into a revelation class? The church at Thyatira had wonderful attributes, but they were not holy. In other words, they didn't gird up the loins of their mind with doctrine. They did not discern, perceive, understand categories. They didn't think their thoughts through with God. I want you to see that the law of the spirit of life is that we think our thoughts through with God. Dia no eo. Think your thoughts through with God. Participate in the action of what God says. 
enter into dogmatic dynamics in your thinking. I challenged three women recently to take a tape recorder and not to let each other know when it was going to be on. And every time they gathered together secretly, agree, not knowing when that would be, to run that tape recorder with one person in charge. Not that the conversations would be bad, but they would be sure be wordy. <laughs> and they would add about, experts tell us that the average woman speaks 24,000 words a day and the average man speaks 16. We've given this to you before. But just to remind you what we gave you in reiteration. And the story we told last semester was that if a man gets his 16,000 in on the job and the woman hasn't got her 24,000 in during the day, it's going to be a very wordy evening. <laughs> and if he doesn't respond, he is going to be asked this question. You just come home and don't want to say a single word. What he should say is, honey, I've had my 16,000 already, and that's as many as a man is supposed to have. <laughs> now, there's many exceptions with you ladies. You're not like that. But 24,000 words was the average conversation of the average woman a day. And, and the, the survey went like this. A woman is talking about the floor. The man says this. The man says, you think, so you, you believe we should have a new linoleum, new carpet, new carpet, right? Yeah. Then she goes into 7,000 words. <laughs> She talks herself out of carpets, into carpets, into this, out of that. And when she gets done, she says, what do you think? <laughs> While she's going through that, he has already made up his mind with her consent. In about 75 words, why don't we just get what we both like, a blue carpet, and have it be nice with a good base, and that's it. But she emphasizes the details of life. That's why she gets so stressed out in her emotions. She goes over the details of life 65 times a, a day. The man hardly hears what she says. <laughs> it's not that, it's just, it's just the way the creature is, that's all. And I'm not favoring either one of the creatures, I'm just explaining what the experts discovered in the survey. She's much better when it comes to preparing a wedding or preparing a party for guests. She's much better. She'll remember all the beautiful things to do and she's very profitable, while the man could care less <laughs> and wouldn't care if they cared. <laughs> our conversation should be, let our words be what? Few. Say it to me, Joanne. Thank you for confessing that. Where, Joanne? On. <laughs> oh, boy. On the earth. <laughs> if you study, if you, you know, heaven doesn't reveal a whole lot to you and I, does it? I mean, what's going on in heaven? We know it's magnificent, it's beautiful, it's precious. It, we would much rather be there, but you hope that God doesn't take you until you're 100. Uh, you know, it's like Bob Jones Sr. used to say, for me to live with Christ and die is gain, and I hope I live to be 110. Uh, I can't quite figure that out, but I, I, I guess there's a law of self-preservation in us that even though to be with the Lord is far better, we don't care if he doesn't hear you right away. It's just the creature again, right? But God wants us to begin to learn how to think our thoughts through with him. 
and to have a conversation from heaven. If you study what's going on in heaven, you will learn one thing. There seems to be, if you study Isaiah 6, 3 with the angels, and you study Revelation 19 with the saints, there seems to be all kinds of praise going on in heaven. Praise, 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 worship, praise, worship, praise, worship. That tells me if heaven is going to be occupied with praise and worship based upon knowing God. So the greatest thing that can happen to us, the things that are pure, kind, lovely, if there be any virtue, be any praise, think on these things. So we must learn the amazing privilege of praising God in our attitudes, praising God with our tongues, and worshiping God in the doctrine of truth. This is, this is the greatest way that men and women can overcome being wordy because a study was made in 1968 that much energy goes out of people when they speak a lot, just with words. And the article said that if anybody is extremely wordy, it could affect and break down their immune system and some people would be more subject to disease just because they're always talking on the phone in different places and it causes so much energy to go out in speaking. You try someday, you just try talking, talking, talking and see if just talking, I'm not talking about teaching, preaching, counseling, that's different. You're thinking with God and that doesn't spend the energy that just plain talking does. So, heaven is filled with praise. Let's be filled with praise down here. And everything give thanks, for everything give thanks, relax. And that's the principle. Believers must have a viewpoint that relates to the plan of God for their lives. They must have a viewpoint that relates to the plan of God for their lives. Number two, they must understand how to relate to holiness in every thought. They must understand how to relate to holiness in every thought. Here's a good one, number three. Your recent circumstances, other than communicating them, must not be the means of talking. Your recent circumstances, other than to communicate them, must not be your reason for talking. Why? Because your recent circumstances may not be separated unto God in holiness to build up the hearer, other than to define what's going on. Many psychiatrists have nervous breakdowns because of what they listen to day in and day out. I should say what they draw out of people in Adam. Now, therefore, every person has power over his thoughts, he has power over his words, and holiness means that his thoughts and words are separated unto God's divine substance and resource in reflection. God wants categorical doctrine to form a new mind. To form a new mind. He wants us through a pastor teacher, through daily intake of the word of God, to get rid of the infections in our lives, in our soul, and to begin to build up confidence. Now watch this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, present active participle of nafal. Freedom from bad thoughts. That's what sober means. Sober doesn't mean that you're serious in terms of melancholic disposition. Sober means that you're fervently, intensely involved with divine thinking. Say that. Sober means that you are seriously, 
fervently involved with divine thinking. It has nothing to do with whether you don't laugh or do laugh. It has to do with fervent, intense reflection of divine thinking. And the word is nafal. Be sober, present, continually be sober, present tense. Active voice, choose to be filled with fervent intensification of doctrine. Participle, you will have a divine truth in your life. That divine truth will set you free from bad thoughts in your mind and give you maturity in your emotions. I'm just touching on some of the areas of holiness the one thing that was lacking in the church of Thyatira is why they were deceived and tolerated the woman Jezebel. All right? Therefore, to be sober means to think with an anchor of grace. In Acts 20.32. Now, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have the imperative aris active here, uh, aris active imperative for elpidzo, for hope. And hope here means elpidzo, have confidence, self-esteem with boldness. Say it. Have confidence with self-esteem and boldness because of what is funneling into your mind. That means you have control when people offend you and you're able to intelligently not even react. You are so stable and mature in the absolute intensification of fervency of divine viewpoint. To the end, this is what it's saying here, to the end that with evidence you have confidence. The evidence of your spirit-filled life is you have confidence. Confidence in however you look. Confidence in whatever income you have. Confidence no matter who's around you. Confidence in your weight. Confidence in your size. You're free. You're free from any bad thoughts toward yourself. You have been given by God confidence because you're renewed in his image. And then I've got to finish this. The word brought, present passive. Here's a present tense, a passive voice of Pharaoh, P H E R O. And I love this because it means present tense, continually, passive voice, receive the action. I must continually, present tense, see, I'm explaining it to you so a child could get it at four years of age. Passive voice, receive the action. What am I to continually receive the action of? Grace! Grace! Something I don't deserve something that I don't earn. That's what's going to produce my whole personal holiness. And grace, grace carried in by the Word of God. So the Word of God brings to me grace, which builds up my self-esteem, which gives me confidence, and it helps me to be separated unto God, and that is called holiness. Now, why am I bringing this up to you when I'm teaching Revelation? Because Thyatira was not holy. Did she have charity? Yes. Faith? Yes. Service? Yes. Patience? Yes. Production? Yes. Do you understand what we're saying this morning? We're saying that you could be the most outstanding Christian in the crowd and not be holy, not be grace-oriented, not live in divine thinking, not have confidence in who you are in the kingdom. This is really something. Now listen carefully. Here we have the instrumental case. I mean the instrumental as a means. This is God's means of building you up into maturity by bringing, having doctrine bring in grace and you receive the action by taking in the light. All right? This doesn't mean second advent. I want to say this, when it says it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, it does not mean second advent. It means remas from discipline of study. Personal instruction. Grace brought in the word for light in you so that you can have complete satisfaction as an individual that lives in who you are in self-essence. How many understand that? Well, 
we've touched upon the weakness of the church, which was they lacked holiness. Then we've explained to you somewhat, and we're not through with that, what holiness is. When God says, be ye holy as I am holy, in our next class, I'm going to exegete that for you, and I'm going to show you not a right-wing interpretation of those two verses, 15 and 16, but an exegetical application of those verses. And they don't mean don't put on lipstick and have your hair above your ears and don't wear slacks. Doesn't mean that at all. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with something else that can make all the difference in the world with Thyatira. It goes way beyond the right-wing concept of holiness. Father, dismiss us in Jesus' name. Amen.